climate change is all your fault. Yes, I'm talking to all of you. You probably drove here, used plastic in the past week, and used way more water than you should. So, it must be. At least, that's what I thought when I first learned about the climate crisis. But I'm here today to tell you I was wrong. Well, mostly. Growing up in Miami, the climate crisis was a constant presence in my life. The idea that we were a frontline community for climate change didn't really register for six-year-old me. Issues like sea level rise, increasing temperatures, and intensified hurricanes were my normal. One of my first memories actually discussing the issue was in the fourth grade with the NOAA, or National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's sea level rise simulator. When I typed in my address and pressed launch, it showed me that the places that made up my daily life, from my school to my home, could be underwater within my lifetime. Pretty scary revelation for a fourth grader. Fast forward to middle school, when I really started getting involved in the realm of climate action. My story, like for many, started with a great teacher in the sixth grade, who encouraged me to pursue my passion and join an organization called the Miami Youth Climate Summit, which essentially provides a meeting place for young climate activists and encourages them to get involved in their local communities. We've been running it ever since, even through the pandemic, garnering support from as many as 1,100 students across six different continents, 18 different countries, and 16 different US states for a virtual 2021 summit. I am now a junior and am going into my second year as president of that organization, which has recently partnered with Breakthrough Miami to provide climate education to young scholars from under-resourced communities. But I definitely had a lot of learning to do before getting to where I am now. As I was first getting involved, I shared many popular misconceptions about what climate activism really looked like. To me, it was bringing a tote bag to the supermarket, remembering to recycle, and swearing off plastic straws. And while all of those things are important and can only have a positive impact, it's unfortunately not that simple. According to the Climate Disclosure Project, 70% of greenhouse gas emissions in the past two decades have come from the same 100 producers, most of which are big oil and gas companies like Shell and ExxonMobil. And what is just as alarming and not talked about often enough is how these same corporations are controlling the discourse about climate change and effectively shifting the blame, making people like you and me think this is our fault. A great example of this is the whole idea of personal carbon footprint a term used very frequently in climate action circles, which actually comes directly from an advertising campaign from the major oil company, BP. They even released their own carbon footprint calculator to encourage consumers to assess how their daily lives are ruining our planet and completely deflecting their own contributions to the crisis. And this is hardly an isolated example. Let's look at BP's American counterpart, ExxonMobil. First and foremost, ExxonMobil has emitted almost 40 billion tons worth of greenhouse gases. To say their impact is huge would be an understatement. Despite this, their public messaging has been incredibly misleading. In 2021, Harvard researchers sought to analyze the ways in which ExxonMobil portrayed themselves to the public. In anything private, they described climate change as an issue caused by fossil fuel combustion. But in anything public, they described it as an issue caused by the energy demand of consumers. This dangerous rhetoric fails to acknowledge where the issue is actually coming from, instead deflecting the blame onto consumers. In fact, the Harvard researchers repeatedly made parallels between this rhetoric and that of big tobacco companies, who use similar rhetoric to shift the blame. And the issue goes beyond this extension of guilt. It's the fact that they've been able to have impacts reaching far beyond just advertising. We see these impacts where it matters most, in political advocacy for climate action. Rather than addressing the root cause, many politicians encourage consumers to fix it. For example, rather than reducing plastic production at a corporate level, they encourage consumers to recycle, which is helpful, but fails to create the same amount of change. This leads to an endless loop of trying to catch up after emitting 
rather than reducing the emissions, talk about a toxic cycle. And the issue here isn't just that they're extending their guilt and polarizing the conversation. It's the fact that they've divided up the people who actually care and turned this into an issue of who's doing enough. Even within the realm of climate action, I've seen others been blamed or been blamed myself for not being a vegan, driving a car, or participating in fast fashion. And while we all should be, to take a page from BP, working to reduce our carbon footprint, it's unfortunately not that simple. And it's not fair to blame people for playing a game that they were set to lose from the start. The bottom line is this. The issue of climate change can't solely be blamed on individuals, so it can't solely be solved through individual acts. The climate crisis is systemic. Not only are we all forced to participate in some way, but the arena of climate action is inherently limited to some. In other words, being a climate activist is expensive. In fact, in a study conducted by Deloitte, 52 percent of consumers say they can't switch to a more sustainable lifestyle because of the price of eco products. This idea of the cost of sustainability, coined by Bill Gates as the green premium, is an inevitable part of the transition into a more sustainable world. We see it everywhere, from charging extra for paper bags, to eliminating plastic waste, to organic food. And it's unrealistic to expect everyone to be able to afford it, especially in an economy suffering from inflation to supply chain issues. What makes this issue even more complex is that an investment in sustainable products isn't necessarily a guarantee that they really are sustainably sourced. Many companies practice greenwashing, which essentially means they make false claims about the positive impacts of their products. Greenwashing comes in many different forms, from vague information to straight up lies to not painting the whole picture. In a study conducted for Google Cloud, 68% of executives admitted to greenwashing in an anonymous survey. That's awfully honest for a group of people essentially lying to the, pro uh, to the public. Practices like greenwashing make the already narrow market for green products even more narrow. And while I'm positive and hopeful that we will get to a place soon where sustainability is affordable, until then, it's important to recognize that this often isn't an issue of want or desire, but of need. We can't expect people not to drive in cities with poor public transit or to buy organic, sustainably sourced food for double the price. Systemic change needs to come first. And what's the best way to make systemic change happen? Education, of course. But in a world where climate change has become increasingly polarizing and politicized, teaching climate change is more than just another day in the classroom. It's a political statement. UNESCO research has shown that the average number of mentions of climate change in US school textbooks has been on the decline since the early 2000s, signaling a targeted attack on climate education. We've heard everywhere that knowledge is power, but this is especially true when it comes to the climate crisis. Every climate activist is the result of some form of education. It might be direct, like I was lucky enough to have and am now providing with the Climate Summit, but it might also be indirect, like social media or advertising campaigns. Regardless, the earlier we start to give young people the gift of climate literacy, the more likely they will be to take action. Okay, let's take a second to pause. <laughs> I've talked time and time again about how corporations, not individuals, should be held responsible for the crisis. Yet I keep coming back to individual action. Why? Well, while the climate crisis may not directly be our fault, it certainly is our responsibility. Gen Z is inheriting the results of generations of consumption without care of emissions without repercussions. And for me and many others, this can cause feelings of climate anxiety and fear. But dealing with that fear is exactly what activism is. It's facing the issue head on and wholeheartedly believing that you can make a difference. It's taking the time to educate ourselves and believing in the power that our voice holds. Climate action comes in many different forms. It can happen on large public scales with public gestures, but it can also happen on a small community or even family scale. 
And action isn't just speaking, but knowing when to listen. That means taking the time to educate ourselves in any way we can. All this is to say that the definition of what climate activism looks like needs to be unbound from its unspoken rules and judgment. First and foremost, everyone needs a seat at the table if we expect any actionable change. Including young people and people from underserved communities should be made a priority, since they're the ones most impacted by the crisis. Next, the climate blame game needs to stop. A lot of the emission shaming of individuals comes from within the climate action community. If we continue to question the validity of someone who cares just because they aren't vegan or drive a car, then we're shutting out a whole group of people who can strengthen the cause. Anyone who wants to learn more should be able to. No questions asked. And finally, one of the easiest ways to fight for climate action is to vote. Climate change is becoming an increasingly important part of the political landscape. Vote for politicians who will make it their priority. Call your representatives, organize petitions, and vote for emission-reducing legislation. You can directly contribute to the systemic change we need. Let's now return to this idea that climate change is all your fault and the anxiety that comes with it. If you only remember one thing from today's talk, I hope it's that you can't let the weight of this issue stop you from taking action. It's all about striking the delicate balance between knowing when companies are deflecting and placing the blame on you, while also recognizing that what you do matters. Through the Climate Summit, I've met so many incredible, inspiring people. Scientists, artists, authors, the list goes on and on. And when I ask them why they take the time to stop and speak, they always stress the importance of outreach. The biggest mistake you can make is underestimating the power you have to spread the message within your community. I don't know what the future of climate action looks like, but I wholeheartedly believe that when we stop pointing fingers and start letting people in, we can change the world for the better. Thank you.